everybody and welcome to this very special Corona broadcast with none other than Ellie Greenwood who is Western States 100 ladies record holder, comrades winner, ultra running coach and two time 100k world champion. So thank you so much for joining us tonight here Ellie and um, yeah tell us a little bit about what the situation's like over there in Canada. Yeah, so thanks for having me, first of all. Um, it's cool to be on your show. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, well, the world has gone, I, I don't want to say crazy, maybe necessarily crazy in the last few days, but I guess, you know, like things have changed compared to, you know, two weeks ago or whatever. I mean, I'm sure Italy and China were there before. But uh, yeah, so I live in uh, North Vancouver in British Columbia, Canada. And uh, yeah, I think we're a little bit ahead of, the UK in terms of like reaction to what's going on so already like our mass gatherings were like curtailed a few days before you guys um, and I will say like I mean like in North Vancouver where I am right now is one of the hotbeds for where the first deaths have been in Canada and like yeah like quite a few people at a care home have got it like workers as well right so I think that makes it around here but to be fair like I mean I'm I'm mostly staying at home um, you know I did my like dutiful thing of going and doing my shopping and then actually getting enough for a week which is very unlike me I normally go in the grocery store like you know every day picking up two or three things um the streets seem kind of surprisingly normal but we're definitely being encouraged to work at home and all that kind of stuff um we can still run outside all the gyms have closed all the pools all that kind of stuff right so uh yeah no people are still running running outside but all the run groups like you know I um I help uh, like lead Sunday runs because we were training for Vancouver Marathon at the start of May that has now been cancelled. And that's kind of the status here. Like anything in May, uh, sorry, anything in April is off the cards in terms of races, like just cancelled, right? Um, and I would say that, I mean, I coach a whole bunch of people like down the West Coast, so Washington State, California and whatever. A few May races are starting to get off the cards, like recently in California, Canyons 100K, which is end of April, and Miwok, which is start of uh, May, those have got cancelled. And yeah, BMO Marathon, sorry, I'm deviating, that has got cancelled, the Vancouver Marathon, which was meant to be the start of May. Last weekend, we still met for our Sunday group run. Uh, we were not high-fiving, we were not having coffee afterwards. We were, you know, and we run in like little groups because we have little pace groups, right? Um, and then as of this weekend, we've decided like, for however long needs be yeah we're not unfortunately going to be doing group runs so yeah and all the run clubs are saying like you know sure go out and run with like you know two three other people um preferably people you know staying in those little social groups um but yeah things are and the ski resorts have shut down just like in europe yeah so. everything is just gone here as well and um we so we've got a little bit of a, a patron kind of pact going where we're all kind of, we're either pledging to to run uh, stick to our training plan and run because a lot of people are like quite demotivated because they had races planned and so people have got pacts going like we've decided as a group we're all gonna like run that mileage or we're gonna run on the race day we're gonna do it just from our house if we can still get out with somehow we're gonna keep it up and we're all supporting each other um, so it's uh, Arlene Maitlock has asked a question um, well you've kind of already said how's your train um, any races cancelled but how's your training in particular gone during the virus outbreak uh, are, you, are you still managing to get on the bike and and while well, you can't swim but um, have you been getting out personally uh not a lot Claire I'll be honest right so um yeah like I, I don't run much these days I've I'll explain briefly but I've got this weird leg that just goes tight and heavy and that's been going on for like four years or so um so yeah right now I'm not running tons so my training had been I mean like I cycle commute to get out right but again my leg is not like I can't really go out and do like super long rides right or it doesn't feel great so yeah so recently I've been doing a lot of swimming and now I can't swim uh so that's like oh okay um so yeah it's a little curtailed I would say um, I went out for a walk yesterday right because I think you know again that idea of like trying to keep in some routine right um, because it's easy to go yeah like everything's off the cards and I'm not doing anything right and, and just get because you're kind of being told to stay at home 
you really start staying at home and no, no you're still allowed to go out and walk around you know staying away from people or whatever right so yeah uh, my plan is i'll do some walking around particularly because and i'm not being funny but i coach a woman in italy um uh, oh, sorry spain so right now she's they're not even allowed to go do that right so you you've kind of got this like you know it's nice to still get outside while you can um i haven't i will admit not really done it yet right but you know there's you can do some strength work at home right um and i was thinking there's um a track it's only about a mile from my house right and they've got like the bleacher seating so like the tiered seating and i was like yeah i might go and try and do some like outside you know stair repeats up there and, and that kind of stuff so just keeping moving right yeah, yeah so keeping moving and i did see on twitter that you've been you have been doing some strength work at home and um, can you just explain to us what what you put on twitter lately uh, so yes okay so um, yeah I started to think the other day because I, I do enjoy doing strength training right and I was like oh the gyms are getting closed uh, so I was lying awake in the middle of the night going like well, what do I have at home like so this is genuine like, like the video as you know is quite comedy right so I was lying awake going like because I live in a small apartment, like I don't have a garden or anything, right? It's like, what do I have that's like vaguely heavy that like I could maybe, you know, do do something with squats, lunges, whatever. And uh, yeah, at this point I realized I have two Western States trophies, um, which are genuinely, I don't know, because I don't have a set of scales. They're really quite heavy. They're massive right? as like, well, aren't they? They're like they're really this big. big. Yeah, yeah, no, they're like pretty big. Um, I can grab one if you want to see it, but uh, yeah, if it's yeah. handy, so, let's see it. Yeah, let's one or two seconds. Yeah, yeah. Um, everyone, get over to Ellie's Twitter because uh, it's really funny. She's doing squats with these huge trophies. So we'll, we'll hopefully she'll show us one just now. Yeah, uh I'll get plugged back in here so yeah okay so yeah the western states trophy i mean fortunately i have two which is handy yeah uh, but anyway so yeah this is a western states trophy wow. and generally i'm not very good at guessing i would say it's maybe about 15 pounds wow. but i'm totally guessing like it's genuinely quite hard uh, quite heavy right like i am struggling to like push that up there yeah but you should struggle when you're doing strength workout so yeah i did a comedy comedy like instagram twitter little video of me doing uh, squats with the two of them on my shoulders which uh, i did as a joke at the time and now i'm starting to think that maybe that's going to become my real life workout so we'll <laughs> yeah see. exactly yeah. that um, so i did want to um I, i've put together a coronavirus playlist where in that is um it's one of those hit sessions a high intensity interval training session with with no weights okay. whatsoever <laughs> because I, okay. I don't have any heavy trophies like that um but uh, but yeah could you as a coach could you kind of just suggest to us a few things that people could do as a home workout like if we do reach the stage where we can't go out running anymore or we just want to augment our usual running or training. you can't yeah i was going to say and we can't go to gyms mm, right and, and yeah. this is what i'm saying to a lot of coaching clients like even if you can go out running if you normally do do strength work like you know that might partly be because of injury prevention so you ideally like it's not that you suddenly like remove that entirely from your training if that's something you normally do a couple of times a week so i mean first proviso i am not a qualified like personal trainer i'm a running coach right but um yeah i'm giving suggestions okay and all things you can do with body weight or you can get creative like my other suggestion is most people have some kind of books right and a backpack and you could put books in a backpack right to do well squats lunges um romanian deadlifts like single leg ones um most people have either a firm sofa or a coffee table um so you could do step ups onto a coffee table <laughs> you could do box jumps uh what other things have we come up with i mean obviously there's a lot of core workouts that you can do oh, right yeah um push-ups push-ups are a good all-round exercise um and then the other one i've thought of today was uh mountain climbers oh um, right so that's in yeah. the plank position is it and then yeah, the each leg position where you're bringing your legs up right like each to the elbow and if you can't do like a full one like that you can have your arms against the wall right or you could have your arms again like on the edge of a sofa right and the same you know if you can't do a full push-up you can do it off you know like um the edge of a sofa and uh, again i would say to folks like right now like you i think 
you, you are similar to us in the UK, right? That, um, you know, gyms are closing, but you can go outside. So you can go to a park and like there's benches, right? And you can do step ups on benches. So, you know, I mean, you did say maybe I think it'd rain today, but if the weather's nice, obviously one of the things is it's nice to get out a little bit. I know it's good to stay away from like, you know, crowds and, you know, grocery stores and all that kind of stuff. But if you've got a park and you, or you can go out and do that kind of stuff. Yeah, so, and some parks yeah. even have yeah. monkey bars and stuff, don't they? Like if you've yeah, got yeah. a park nearby with yeah. those exercise things, like maybe take some antibacterial wipes or you know the gel stuff I I saw people doing that yesterday and I was like I hope you can go home and really thoroughly wash your hands right um yeah and then the other thing you know I'm suggesting to people if they are a bit of you know if you live in an apartment um or if you're still going into work or whatever you know a lot of places there are stairs right and you can do stair repeats as well right um and that might actually be a good suggestion if if anybody's training for like um a, a summer race like a hilly trail race and if you're oh i normally go to the gym and go on the treadmill to do hills well maybe you've got some stairs somewhere and the actual advantage of stairs over you know going steep on a treadmill is you get the downhill as well right? yeah yeah so, true so stairs could actually be yeah. great like unless you start wearing your carpet out then it's going to be awesome isn't it yeah, exactly, exactly. And again, like, and this was more for my like my coaching clients that's in Spain and is literally trapped inside. Yeah, I was saying, you know, try and balance. Like, obviously, some workouts are like totally a bit more strength based, and others are more cardio, right? So the only thing I've come up with her is if she is allowed into her hallway, she can do stair repeats because you can do that for an hour or more. Really? Right? So, like, what would you recommend? Like, do three and have a rest, or then do three and have a rest, or just, like, go at it for a whole hour with I a mean, podcast on or something? It kind of depends what you're training for, right, Claire, yeah. right? Um, and again, I was saying, like, you know, if somebody's not done a lot of hills, don't do... I, I would ease into stair repeats because you're because so, going down is like loading on your legs right so if you're like oh this is a great idea right like ease into it and it depends right like are you training for 100 miles or are you training for some like I don't know short fell race or something right um, and you might vary it right but no I've had I had say people do like an hour of stair repeats before and I say you know like you can jog or you can walk up right and then just jog down right so again the longer you do it you might go oh I'm actually just like walking up and down or if you're like oh I'm going to do this yeah you might do three minutes hard right and then two minutes easy you can you I mean you can be pretty creative right um, yeah and obviously the longer you do it I wouldn't be saying yes go and wear a heavy backpack right but if you're going you again you can make it harder for a short amount of time by yeah throw, throwing on that backpack of books and doing your stair repeats yeah that is a so, great idea and if the books yeah. are a bit uncomfortable you could always like fill water bottles you know the squishy ones yeah. squish them in exactly. just get some or, food um, in there <laughs> Bags of rice. Bags yeah, of yeah. rice, flour, yeah, yeah. 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 anything. Unless, no. unless you're so depleted anything. that you have to eat the rice and the flour. <laughs> Put your cat in there, get your cat in there. Presumably you've not eaten the cat yet. I have seen someone, uh, they saw my Western States video and then they did squats with their dogs. Look, oh, wow. Their dogs oh, so, brilliant. So there you go. Oh, yeah. fantastic. So, the only ideas we've come up with if you're really 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 stuck inside right for cardio is yeah if you can do stair repeats or if you have anything that resembles a skipping rope oh a skipping rope yeah and not too low I mean, lighting <laughs> no no exactly right and i mean personally i've not skipped like i don't know since i was like probably like 10 or 11 yeah. or something right but again it's a super workout it right? is oh so. and if you've got one of those trampolines in the garden like if you're allowed well, into your garden well, so Options, all sorts There's so of much options. we can do. I, yeah. I think next week I'm going to make it my mission to do a film on home workouts because this could be so useful if we approach the time where we do actually have to do full on lockdown and not even allowed out of the house. So I'm going to write that on my to do list. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, that's that's fantastic. Um, uh, so I feel like we should talk a little bit about you, Ellie, because um, there's loads of love for you on the live chat just here, and I just want to read out a few things. Um, um, there's lots of people saying hi, first of all, um, and loads of people just going mad for your um, Western States record in particular. So we've got um, Graham Howes. He says, good evening, Claire and Ellie. Hope you're both well. 
I think we are just now. Yeah, um, yeah. Conrad Anderson is watching from Michigan, um, so oh. that's great. Uh, we've got Robin Townsend tuning in from the northeast of England. We've got Nigel Barnett. Oh, we have a new person, A. Armstrong. Hello from a newbie. Um, Guy Greatorex is here. He hopes everybody is doing well. Um, John Gardner is over in the US as well. He's saying hi. Um, and um, Graham says, all this lovely ultra running content is right up my alley. I love anything ultra related. So we are, we are doing a public service yeah, we're here tonight. We're in the right place, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, let us just get some, there was a question. Oh yeah, we have a question for you on the live. So I'll we'll see when that fits in soon. And then um, John Gardner says, um, uh, wow, he's talking about your trophies that you, you held up. He said, <laughs> one of those two Cougar trophies still stands as the course record. Um, and then people are like, how long has the record stood? Um, and um, and everyone's like, I believe Ellie set it in 2012, which which is correct. That is correct. I even, yes. I, I even wrote down the time. Because well, even I was starting to go, I, I think it was 2012, but I can't remember. <laughs> it's it's starting to get so long ago that I can't quite remember. But yeah, it was 2012. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and then there's loads of like record chat about Courtney on record pace last year before she dropped out. Um, yeah, so yeah. the record's still standing strong. People like saying, oh, Courtney's the only one to beat it. So, But we'll ask you that later in the show because I just want to talk yeah, about yeah. your achievements just now. Um, so I'm just going to read some out. I don't care if it makes you um, uh, embarrassed because I know you're a modest person, but I just want everyone to know like how cool you are and what amazing career in ultra running you've had so um uh it might not be in the right order <laughs> but um but the first thing is western states 2012 uh record which still stands today so 16 hours 47 19 not many women have come under 17 hours so a like absolutely incredible record there um then there's the jfk 50 same year you just went on this like absolute smashing bender of breaking every single record going um and you were actually 10th overall in that race as well which is absolutely incredible incredible um you've won the ccc also in 2012 um you that you had an injury in 2013 but then you came back to win the comrades um in 2014 and you were actually the first british woman to or were you the first brit or the first british woman to win comrades no the i couldn't say the year there would be british guys who've won it but yeah probably like quite a long time ago like yeah. maybe in the 70s uh, or something i'd have to check claire yeah, yeah. but yeah. first british woman anyway um uh, which is fab um and then just going uh just going back to 2010 when you started kind of like winning everything you won your first 100k world championships um and then in 2014 you also won that as well oh and back in 2010 you also uh, broke the record for the 125k canadian death race so yeah. loads so yeah um so i just want to make everyone aware that there's an amazing podcast um with ellie talking about loads of these races by dylan bowman and i've put a link to it in the description below so you could we're not going to discuss like everything in so much detail here but just definitely go over to that podcast because it's absolutely fascinating like your win at comrades was i was on the edge of my seat on my run <laughs> going, oh, is she gonna get past the twins ah like it was great i loved it um so that is fantastic fantastic um but i just um wanted to ask you if you've got any was any particular year your your favorite of those years or is there any race record or win that's with the most close to your heart what would you say um so 2012 i ra raced a lot right so you know that i can kind of in one way i could say that was my best year and maybe favorite year just because I got to go and run and like you said like CCC so I got to go run in the Alps right um, and you know I did run Western States and you know all sorts of comrades that year all that kind of stuff right so and there was lots of like other ones within North America right so in a way maybe that year but then also I mean 2014 uh, so I won comrades and I won world 100k for the second time um, I mean, it's really hard to say, Claire, right? Because there's, like, there's races, for example, like JFK, which I love, and probably a lot of the people watching are like, oh, I never heard of it, <laughs> right? And some of the people may would go and go, this course is awful, because it's 50 miles with 
26 miles of it on a canal towpath. Oh, so I totally appreciate it's not for everyone. But, you know, it's one of the oldest, if not the oldest, um, ultras in North America. Like, it's got to be, when I ran it in yeah, 2012, it was 50 years old, right? Um, I think... I mean, the race that probably means the most to me is Comrades, um, simply for the fact, like, I won it on my third attempt. On the second time I ran it, I came second, but I was only, like, 72 seconds behind the winner. Then the next year I had a stress fracture, and then I went back and won it. So it was this sort of, like, process, whereas, like, don't get me wrong, I love Western States, and it's kind of nice to have the course record. Um, But I showed up at Western States in 2011 and won, and then I showed up in 2012, and got the course record so you know i didn't go through the sort of process that it go to whereas comrades was like right i got a fourth and thought wow this race is so cool and then i got a second and was like close to the lead and then i couldn't run it so there was much more of a sort of like you know story around it in my rather than oh i showed up and won okay that's kind of nice right so yeah but definitely western states the course record and i think comrades winning that are up there right yeah so, and yeah both are just such old established races aren't they it's such a deep field and like you really know that you've done well if you've got one record or one or one of those yeah and i mean they're such different races as well right like obviously again i'm sure a lot of people know comrades right but you know like in most years about sixteen thousand people run it it's getting close to 100 years old right like because it's a road race like all the supporters come out so it's a totally different like atmosphere um and of course i mean like the court to me the course is very nice right but it's not the same as of course going to a trail race where you know maybe something like western states where there's bits where you're like oh this is a beautiful trail right and again western states it's a reasonable sized race but it's not enormous so it's different because you come into aid stations and all your friends and all the ultra running community are there whereas you know comrades is this big road race and of course I do know a whole bunch of people there but there's also yeah that just like it's a massive event right so they're they're very different right yeah yeah really yeah. different it's nice to have that variety as well and and it's nice to be able to kind of do really well over such different terrains yeah yeah so that's fab and um I have got a couple of questions um there's there's one about the comrades here actually from Graham Howes um he says I have a question for Ellie what are the fundamental differences in how you approach an ultra marathon from the perspectives of a just running to the finish and two just uh, actually racing it especially something as tough as the comrades okay so yeah, I guess so. So sort of he's asking, yeah, like if somebody's just like, hey, I'm in for this for participation, or I want to get like my best possible time, right? Um, I mean, I guess you could, in one say, say the volume and slightly the type of training that you do, right? Like for something like comrades, like you know, it's a good idea to do some pretty long runs and obviously some pretty hilly stuff, right? But if you're thinking, you know, and if you want to do as well as you possibly can, if you're more in it for like, you know, I just want the experience. And I do think people can only say that if they're good enough to do that, right? Mm. Do you know what I mean, right? Like, I hate to say it, when I when I won uh, Comrades, I could have slowed down an awful lot and gone, oh, that was fun, and I made it to the finish. Whereas there's people I coach where they're working really hard to just make it to the finish, right? Um, So, yeah, probably, like, you know, your weekly volume, maybe how much you focus on it, like, do you throw in, like, the year I won Comrades, like, I really wiped my slate clean and I only put races in in the months in advance that would really complement and help me towards Comrades. Whereas maybe if you're doing it as a, like, I just want the experience, you might throw in a race that on paper is like, well, that's not the most, you know, textbook preparation, but it's okay, right? Um, And then, again, I don't know if he's run comrades, right? Like, compared to trail racing, I get it, it's not overly hilly, but for a road race, it is very hilly, right? Now, if, again, you're a good enough runner that you could, you know, just run it, 
you could skimp a little bit on the hills in training. Whereas again, if you want to get your best possible time, well, one, you want to be stronger running the uphills and you also want to be prepared for, you know, a lot of the, you know, the impact of downhill running on tarmac, right? Which is even worse than, you know, downhills on trails, right? So yeah, volume type of training, how you schedule the months in advance and yeah that kind of stuff that's, so that's fantastic yeah. i hope that answers your question graham um and thank you very much for it and um uh we've got another question about training actually here from conrad anderson who um he says he's he's kind of new to the whole ultra running thing and he is wondering whether ultra runners create peaks in their training um similar to marathon runners um and how much does their mileage how much do their long runs get up to because presumably if you're training for 100 miles you don't have to run 100 miles to you no and like exactly like and it's a good question if if conrad you haven't run like ultras before like i see too many people like it, okay if you're going to run a marathon you go well maybe you know i think most people get up to like at least 20 miles some people maybe like a little bit more right and so then you go oh well i'm going to do 50 miles so i should go out for a 44 mile training run and i'm like no like stop stop right <laughs> particularly if you're newer at it right whereas sure and and this is something to be aware of you know like if you're I don't know, on forums or groups or whatever, if experienced ultra runners are like, oh, well, I just knocked out this, you know, like 50K training run, right? Well, they might be able to do that because, hey, they've already run 10, 50K races, right? Um, but yeah, the same, I mean, I think the same principles apply to, you know, regardless of what distance you're racing, be it half marathon, marathon, 100 miles, something in between, right? Of, you know, you want to, pick your focus race your you know you count backwards right um and as a general guide i mean i this might okay if someone's doing 50k so like 31 miles i think it's nice to get up to minimum one marathon distance long run right and you might go a bit longer and you might do more than one de again depending on your experience right um and then yeah and then if you go up to 50 miles uh, from a lot of people I would give them like hey maybe you want to do a 50k and that can be on your own or you know maybe you choose a race and you go I'm just going to go for like the experience and you know that kind of thing but maybe up to 50k and even for 100 miles and let, again it depends on someone's experience right but I would not go like for very few people would I give them over 50k in training right but once you get to and this is this is trying to cover lots of things at once <laughs> yeah, right it's hard, isn't it? <laughs> Once you get to like kind of 50 miles, I think definitely 100K, i.e. 62 miles or 100 miles, then there comes that concept of back-to-back -back runs, right? So you might go one day, oh, I went out and run like 24 miles. And then the next day you might go, oh, I went out and ran, and I'm going to say 10, and it might be more or whatever, right? But you don't go, whereas in your marathon training, you might have been, oh, I did my 20 mile long run, so I'm going to have a rest day the next day, which is a totally valid thing to do, right? But I think once you, you don't need to do back-to-back -back runs, I don't feel, for 50K. For 50 miles, they can start coming in, and yet yeah, definitely once you get to 100K and 100 miles, you kind of want that time on feet, right? Um, so back-to-back -back runs can often come in. So, yeah. yeah, it's a whole different ball game, isn't it? And I, I did notice in the Dylan Bowman podcast, you did talk about the fact that you didn't just come into running and stuff like 100 miles. You'd actually been running for quite a long time and been really, really quite cautious about your distance and upping your distance. Um, so I just thought that was really sound advice um, for, for yeah. everybody, right? especially right now as ultras are like, everyone's like, oh my God, I must do 100 miles and they want to do it this year. Um, so I just think that was really good to... to focus on well and in one way okay you get like the physical conditioning right but i always say like you know if you go into a 50 miler and you're like oh i've done 150k and i was nauseous at like 20 miles and then i started vomiting and kind of stumbled my way to the finish i'm like okay well you're just over halfway and you're 50 miler <laughs> that's gonna happen right so you want to know like yeah like okay what shoes are comfortable which ones don't give me blisters right um yeah like what can i eat what can i drink just by default by having more experience oh you've run on some super hot days and some really rainy days or maybe once you went on a hilly trail run and what so you just have more tools and experience to draw on is my personal thing People can jump in and go from a marathon to 100 miles. Of course they can, right? Um, but I think 
yeah is it always sensible and maybe people want to think about that before they like really commit to it because I totally get it and I've sorry I always give vlog answers Clara <laughs> <It's> uh, <okay. laughs> so, you know, like, I get it you, you see these YouTube videos or you watch one of your videos no not like, what I find I'm always telling people to slow down and just do a half marathon it's fine just yeah. like, go to the pub <laughs> like, and I get it and, and and like there's absolutely nothing wrong and I have coaching clients who are like no I just love 100 miles and I'm like that's awesome that's cool <laughs> like you know but running 100 miles isn't better than running a half marathon right it's very different right and yeah just really like think about it and I totally again get it that some people are more risk takers but when I've coaching clients come to me and they're like right so I've run 150k and I've signed up for this 100 miler because I know I really want to do it I'm like I don't know you really know I get it that it super appeals and then I'm then I'm kind of like sure let's well it depends on who they are right but let's work towards it but don't feel defeated if you get halfway through and go do you know what I don't know I do actually want to do this anymore because you know we these things and it looks cool but until you go like what is it like when you're I don't know 12 hours into a run and so part of the reason for doing some of the you know shorter ultras is you get those experiences and actually find out like if you like it as well yeah so. yeah that's a really good answer and really good advice as well and it's just so different for everybody isn't it um so and, and you mentioned the heat there in the experience in building up to these kind of longer events and um, we've got a question on the live chat from john gardner um one of my patrons who says um to win western states even in good weather you have to be strong in the heat so question for ellie um how, what kind of stuff does she advise for training in the heat yeah okay so i hope sorry oh sorry training for the heat training for the heat sorry was it john who's called it yeah, anyway john, i yeah. hope he does not have a hot race coming up because you probably can't get in a sauna right now <laughs> <laughs> well i don't think any races so, are coming up right now <laughs> it'll be true, winter okay. by the time we're racing again so, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So the first thing I say for heat training is like, okay, if somebody is doing Western States, fingers crossed in June, right? You do not need to start doing heat training now, right? So you make most of your adaptations in two weeks and you still will make more in three, right? Once you get out like longer than three weeks, you're going to stay equally as adapted, but you're not actually getting that much proportionally better at the heat, right? So normally if you're going to do heat training, start it about you know two or three weeks before your race right um which is helpful because you're then starting to taper or you drop back your runs and you've got a little more time right um and then some basics i mean what i did um you know there's hot yoga but again i say if you never do yoga don't start getting to hot yoga every day of the week when you're tapering and then you're like oh i've pulled the hamstring right so hot yoga if you already do some kind of yoga can be an option um obviously and this is one that ian shaman's big on is like bundling up in a, like a million layers right and literally like putting a woolly hat on even though it's like 20 degrees outside putting a buff over your face wearing ski mitts like wearing two sets of like you know like maybe a pair of leggings and a pair of like jogging bottoms over the top and that kind of stuff right and then well, you can run on a treadmill because it's usually hotter in the gym, right? Or you just go outside and bundle up like that. The option I usually more went for was spending time in the sauna because, well, it's nice to go and sit in a yeah. sauna. It's much more pleasant, right? Um, and I didn't do any bizarre exercises in my sauna. Um, I just sat there, read a running magazine. <laughs> but I would do that. And you have to, ideally, you do it, what? It would be wonderful if you could do it every day, like in, you know, about the three weeks up to your race, although I'd taper off for the final few days before the race. If you can only, say, go to a sauna twice a week, I would really question whether you're going to make much, much adaptation. You might get a bit comfortable with the idea of being uncomfortably hot, but actually making adaptations you don't. Um, and you start out with however long you can tolerate and you build up gradually like day to day so yeah that's what I did and um, yeah and the idea is to teach your body to like sweat more and process liquids so I always recommend folks like you know take water in before make sure you're hydrated if you come out you'll probably go oh yeah I am a bit thirsty so make sure you drink because that's the point of it the point is not to get super dehydrated right because that doesn't do anything you're now not sweating so yeah and then there's also race like management on the day right so you know 
for example, Western States. Um, you know, you'll have seen like Jim Walmsley, one of the first years he ran, he had the holes cut out in his shirt, right? I always wore like a white cap, right? So wear your light colors, wear super light fabrics, always have your sunscreen on, or you see some people with their arms covered in like a white long sleeve, right? Um, and then using ice, right? You know, so you can put ice under your hat, ice around your neck, down your sports bra is very handy for putting ice down there, right? Um, and then depending on the race, right? But, um, you know, if there's any creek crossings or whatever, like fully getting in the water and getting like soaking, soaking wet, right? And if you've got the luxury of time with the cutoffs, you know, spend five minutes. Like, you know, people do that Western States, five minutes in the Rocky Chucky River crossing, right? Oh, sounds lovely. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so there's two things, I think, for, you know, the few weeks before getting ready for the heat and then how you manage it on the day and just accepting that you will go slower, mm. right? Like, even if you're heat adapted you, and everyone is going to go slower, right? Um, so I think that's quite important to, you know, if you know you're going into a race that's like, and it doesn't even have to be hot, it just has to be hotter than you're used to training in, kind of accepting like, oh, if you think, hey, well, I think I can do this time, mm, wait a minute, race day's 30 degrees hotter than I've been training in, mm, those times are probably not realistic in the conditions you're going to be running in. Mm. So, and, yeah. and it doesn't come as a surprise that both you and Tim Olsen got your lowered the record course records of Western Sakes quite drastically in a cooler year. I know there was different things to contend with and you had to adapt for that and you know put gloves on, get people to open gels for you. Yeah. But um, surely everybody's body is working slightly better if it's not having to combat this amazing heat. Well, totally. And it wasn't just me and Tim Olsen, like you know, the, mo the, the percentage that got under 24 hours hours the percentage that finished the race like it was like higher than normal exactly yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So yeah. being prepared for conditions on the day. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. And we don't have a ton of like really hot races over here in the UK, apart from unprecedented hot summers that we had two yeah, years ago. But lots of, but, well, like lots of Brits always do MDS. Yes. And yeah. Again this year, right? But yeah, those kind of things. Yeah. Right? Exactly. So, really useful. Yeah. Get all your clothes on. Get training in the shower. In the <laughs> shower while the shower's running. Just like jog on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I've got a, another live question here from Guy Greater X. Um, uh, he oh uh, two people asking the same question actually um, so Guy starts it all off he says hi Ellie if you work standing all day is that good training for an ultra like should you include that in your plan and then um, A Armstrong has come in with good question Guy I'm a gardener and spend most of my day walking around people's gardens would that help me prepare so yeah like do you have clients that have active jobs what how do you advise them yeah, no, definitely. And I think it can depend, right? So, sorry, the first guy was like, do you work standing? Well, like, and I know he wasn't asking me particularly, right? But right now, I'm standing at my I kitchen counter. I thought you might be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a fat desk. So, hey, folks, you can use your kitchen counter, right? But anyway, so, okay, I'm standing. That's different from being a gardener and doing manual work, right? Um, so, I mean, like anything, yes, I think being on your, like, uh, and I'm not one of these obsessive people and, you know, s sitting as the new smoking or whatever, right? But quite clearly, the majority of us spend, you know, more than a recommended amount of time for our general health sitting down, right? So, yeah, if you've got a desk job and you can stand up for some of it, right? And I say, but, you know, like, can you have a phone call standing up, right? You know, or little things, like even if you are often having to stand and uh, sit down and do some typing, right? Or maybe you've got the luxury to get standing desk, right? If you do something like that, again, don't go from like, I have a, you know, 40 hour, like a week uh, desk job where I've been sitting and now I'm suddenly going to stand up for 40 hours, right? Like anything, I would say, baby, try it for an hour or two every day and get into it. And then you might get to a point where you're standing up. Um, if it then comes to like a physical job, like being a gardener or I know people like that are, uh, sorry, like... Um, we call the mail carriers postmen, right? Yeah, sorry, I'm trying to speak British. <laughs> but, uh, so, yeah, like if you're a postman or you work in like building, like that kind of stuff, 100% it is helpful. And I think more so like the longer the race is, right? So a marathon de Saab where, you know, anybody, even if they're doing really well, you're moving at a pretty modest pace, right? So it's about time on feet or if you're training for a hundred miler, right? So that's definitely relevant. But I think 
if your work is, you know, to the extreme of like, no, it's really physically demanding, like, you know, be, maybe being a gardener, right? I also think you actually have to take that into account in training because it's, it's kind of useful, but it can be a bit detrimental as well. So it just depends on the extreme of, do you mean standing at an office desk for two hours a day? I think that's awesome. Working like labor on a construction site, it's kind of good training unless that's so exhausting that now you're struggling to do your running and then you might actually have to dial your running back and definitely consider that kind of thing in the taper to a race as well yeah. right um, so, well guy yeah. the original um question uh, asker he is a valeter so he um cleans people's cars like outside oh, inside so that's kind of good kind of core i suppose you're kind of always up and down and lifting around so yeah. And yet he's probably not like, sorry, girl, you're probably not lifting anything that's really heavy, right, or anything like that, right? And yeah, so I would have thought that's advantageous. And again, like like anything in training, it depends, right? You know, if you're 25 or you're 55, well, a 25 year old, you know, doing that kind of valet job is like, yeah, sure, like I can manage that. I've got tons of energy at the end of the day, but obviously once you get a little older, uh, it starts to become more tiring. So yeah. Yeah, so yeah, just yeah. gotta take no, it. it useful right and sometimes I know they're not always super accurate you know but they're getting more popular like these step counters or whatever right and yes yeah, sometimes it's interesting to wear those if you've got a physical job and you know see what see how many steps you're taking yeah so. well, that's funny you said that because Chrissy TV says um, she works as a housekeeper and she does 14 to 18 thousand steps just at work so if she does training after that like plus running she ends up doing 25,000 steps a day six days a week um, which does sound like it like a lot doesn't it <laughs> yeah and, and I mean again I, I don't want to get like you can't really give personal advice right but somebody like that I might say okay you might have a day off work that you also say is a non-run day so you have genuinely a day off because the trouble is most of us go oh it's my day off work so I'll go out for a long run but if you've got a super physical job sometimes in a way it can be a bit better to double up a run on a work day and then you carve out like at least one day in the week where you know you're not going out on your feet a ton right so good yeah. advice good advice um that's excellent so um so yeah i've covered a couple of live questions and now going to get back to uh the pre-asked patron questions i'm gonna uh, one last kind of training question some tips from the inside for you coming up and then we're going to go through some nutrition and then some some women's uh, particular um running tips so we've got from arlene matelock uh she says fantastic that you are the ladies record holder for the jfk 50 miler um do you have any tips for that race because i was thinking about signing up for it Oh, okay. Do we know where she's from? No. Uh, yeah, America. Um, but I'm not sure exactly where. Um, okay. If you start answering it, I can find out where she's <laughs> okay. from because it no, will no worries, be okay. on Patreon. So, Hang on a sec. <laughs> and again, just just so uh, yeah, anybody that's watching, like, no. So JFK is I don't want to say bizarre, but it's quite a unique race, uh -huh. right? So you have 17 miles to start with where you start out on a road but it goes uphill oh. you soon get onto the Appalachian Trail which is one of the long distance hiking trails in North America um, and sorry this is on the east coast of the US um, so then you're on reasonably technical trail until about mile 17 yeah then you then you hit this canal towpath which is crushed like limestone gravel wow. and you have got 26 miles with no bends and you just go straight and flat because it's a towpath and then at the end you have eight miles on like rolling rural roads right so it is quite like i said unique because you've got all those elements so the main thing one i would highly recommend jfk it's a great um you know first timer 50 miler it's got a big field of runners they're very friendly there's lots of aid stations so you're never going like you know and you don't ever feel like you're super remote so if you're a little like newer to that kind of stuff you know it's fairly like you know uh you know fairly introductory atmosphere right um so the main thing is you don't have to be a super good trail runner 
but ideally if you can get on as technical trails as you can find depending on where she lives right i've just found out where she lives news flash uh she lives in maryland only one hour's drive from there she's actually watching right now um but i did uh, look on her patreon thing she lives um in laurel um i have no idea where that is and it said laurel md and i was like i have no idea what that means so i'm glad you're here arlene and uh, thanks for telling us that you live an hour away so she lives yeah very close to the race right so you need to be proficient enough on reasonably technical trails that the first 17 miles doesn't beat you up right um and then the main sort of strategy i would say in the race right is people always say you don't win the race on the first 17 miles or i would say even if you're not planning to win it you don't make your race but you can break it right so if you go too hard on that technical hilly terrain for the first 17 miles you then get onto what is meant to be a very runnable 26 miles and you can't run because you're destroyed right so be good enough and patient enough on the first like appalachian trail bit and the hills and you know given you live close to there i would suggest you get on some of that course right and you don't need to by any means do all your training on there but enough and then just hold back you're way better to go slower on that section on race day right and then once you get onto the towpath you know again if you're up at the front people are literally running every single footstep or you know i often suggest to people it's easy to go too fast on that so if you're a bit of a slower runner you might actually want to do a run walk strategy like there's usually an aid station every four or five miles and you might go do you know what i'm gonna walk for like you know three or four minutes through every aid station just to like slow myself down right so yeah but hopefully that's a few tips yes well i think you've got to do it now arlene haven't you <laughs> that is absolutely fantastic so and, and it's in november so oh, it might might place. actually happen yay um cool we've got um 15 minutes left uh, depending if that's okay with you ellie um so i'm just going to read out some people's uh uh Uh, thank yous basically to the people who um, you have answered their questions and they are very thankful to you Um, and then we've got a couple of questions on nutrition and then um, one on women's running so we hopefully fit that into the next 15 minutes so um, Graham Howe said thank you for asking my question and thank you for the excellent answer Ellie lots to take away so amazing um conrad says thank you ellie really appreciate really like the answer lots of info for me appreciate appreciate it um uh then um uh someone saying we um should all sign up for a hundred miler together (laughs) Uh, no (laughs) um yeah and um Oh, there, there's so many comments. It's just, um, it's just I'm trying to find the next one that, of the person that you answered the question to. Um, da, da, da. Yes, here we go. Guy Greatrex, thanks for the great answer. And um, Chrissy TV, she's come back and said, because she had a really physical job as housekeeper, she says, one of my two days off has to be only for shopping, eating, and uh, spa and resting. Good. Perfect. Yeah, so she's already doing the right thing. Um, and Arlene says, thank you so much. Um, she is slow and she's worried about the time cutoffs. Um, and- I, yeah, I, I mean, slow is a relative term, Arlene, so I can't answer that question. I wouldn't be too worried about that. So, yeah. yeah. Yes, I'm sure she can do it. And um, if not, just have a go and then do it again, you know? <laughs> it's like, yeah, no, you, exactly. You won't know if you don't exactly. try. Um, and if you're slow, sorry, Claire, I always like to give last minute advice, right? <laughs> if, if, she, if she genuinely feels I'm slow, right? it's the kind of course focus on getting a bit faster like actually being a runner on that course you know some some ultras you can like hike away for hours but because jfk has got like 37 pretty runnable miles if you could even get a little faster at say a half marathon it will actually help you so don't get obsessed about massive miles yeah that's so. interesting that is you don't always have to go long do some speed stuff as well yeah Fantastic. Well, um, we're uh, you're in, this is going so well, Ellie. Thank you so much for coming on. Because um, um, A Armstrong says this interview is brilliant, Claire and Ellie. So much brilliant information. <laughs> Bob Barr says great interview. It's cool, isn't it, doing it live because you get a sense of who's actually yeah. who you're helping. You're helping people with first-hand advice. So we're going to move on um, to nutrition now. Um, there's a couple of very uh, similar questions. Um, so um, just generic um, kind of nutrition during races. Kind of do you 
personally use um, foods and what person what personal foods and gels do you use um, and for recovery as well um, so we can talk about that and then also there's a question about um, keto diets you know like um, low carb high fat um, is that good for endurance running um, so yeah should we just go for what you okay. generically eat first of all on a ultra run yeah. for like during it okay. and then recovery yeah okay so I mean first not a qualified nutritionist <laughs> not a dietist right just so you don't when you're vomiting at mile 40 blame me um no okay so um again it's very individual and everybody should practice it in training so just because your friend I don't know eats like Toblerone halfway through a race <laughs> that might be the worst thing you could ever have right the base well what I always did when I raced I had to fairly strong stomach I would say um, you know there's a couple of races I vomited at but not too many um, so I did gels shot blocks cliff energy drink and salt and vinegar crisps mm. and that was pretty much it some people you go and what did you do at Western States I'm like gels <laughs> shot blocks salt and vinegar crisps <laughs> energy drink right <laughs> now but I do put, anyway so that's what generally I would do right then if people want more general guidelines okay you mostly want it to be carbs right you want it pretty condensed calories right so you know like I had a newer runner and they're like oh I'm eating bananas I'm like that's wonderful you're going to have to have two and a half bananas an hour to get enough calories <laughs> I think this is a bad idea they said I agree right so you know that's why why are we all eating you know stuff like you know chocolate bars or gels or this kind of stuff i don't think you necessarily need to go for the packaged products right like the gels and and the, and the blocks and the bars but of course the reason that they can be good is you know they're mostly carbs they've got some electrolytes i.e salts in them right and they are condensed you know like you get a lot of calories in them and they tend to be easily digestible mm. right they're handy in those little um, packets and they last for a long time and you know again like and again this is a very general rule right it depends you know but maybe you want somewhere in the 200 to 300 calories an hour range right well if you're grabbing random stuff from aid stations that is fine but have an idea what you know uh you know a chocolate chip cookie how many calories has that got in it right rather than just oh i'm grabbing stuff because particularly if you start grabbing you know stuff like you know fruit you're going oh i'm eating a lot yeah but it doesn't actually have that many calories in it and it's not to say you shouldn't have it right whereas the packaged stuff you turn it over and you're like it's got this much <laughs> you're like oh my or, god i definitely shouldn't eat that while sitting here making editing no. a youtube film no no, no one does no. that ever <laughs> should, should have long runs right so yeah practice in training even if you don't think you like need it for the training runs right it's good practice so you know what works for you on race day have a look on race websites what products are they offering maybe you want to try those that kind of stuff and then of course it depends you know like there'll be people maybe listening that are going to say oh I'm running a 50k and they're wanting to break four hours and then there's somebody else doing a hundred miler that's going to take them 34 hours once you start I think getting into that like hundred mile thing and going much longer yeah you might want one you might go off sweet stuff so do consider that right of like okay are there some savory things and also you might just want like a bit of like real food right yeah. so say people doing UTMB they might like you know their friend brings them a couple of slices of pizza or you know a mm. Tupperware full of pasta or like that kind of stuff right uh -huh. so yeah and consider weather as well right because the hot again the hotter it is the more you can drink your calories if you have a really cold race you don't need much fluids right or not as much you're not going to sweat as much so if you're holding these bottles full of liquid and that is your calories as well but you're like I'm feeling bloated because I just don't need this amount of liquid then you're a bit in trouble right so it might vary on the distance of your race and you know the, the weather and that kind of stuff so and yeah. that's that's interesting as well because we, like we all know the longer the race the more you need normal food but Bob Barr is just saying um he feels sick after 30 miles or so he said it it doesn't matter if it's tailwind or gels um any tips pickle juice um but I, I think maybe he just needs to get some real food inside him if if that's not happening um as well as the tailwind and the gels i think yeah that's i mean it's a hard one right um i would consider yeah okay so some people can eat like the same thing right and they just like stomach that 
I don't know, is he eating the same thing? Or equally, if you're just grabbing, which I don't think, I'm sure he isn't, right? Like absolutely random things. Are you? Is it what you're mixing together that isn't working? Yeah, maybe way? the tailwind and the gels isn't mixing together right. Yeah, you've just got to experiment, exactly. haven't you? So many it, times. Experiment, maybe you're having too many electrolytes, exactly, right? Or, and I mean, some people's strategy is, you know, eat the package stuff so you know gels tailwind you know that kind of stuff until you go off that and then switch to real food other people do it the other way around right but and i don't think either's right or wrong but maybe that's something to consider do you try and then i would also say okay he's obviously said right here get to 30 miles and i feel sick okay well and maybe again he's not doing this right but like don't wait until you're like whoa I feel really terrible if you start to go like "Mm, how am I feeling I'm 24 miles in right and maybe at that point you switch Mm -hmm. right yeah Um, and it just you know because sometimes the temptation is I don't really know what to do so I'm just going to keep doing this until it becomes really terrible now you've kind of dug yourself in a hole Mm -hmm. right um coke can be a lifesaver in Mm -hmm. those scenarios yeah so Cool. Yeah. That is excellent advice. And um, so that's fab. And then what about these low carb, high fat diets? Because that is like all the rage with ultra runners um, in this day and age, isn't it? Yes. Um, okay. I'm, I'm not the expert, Claire. I will say this, right? Um, personally, okay. Like, okay. If, if pe- people can eat whatever they want, right? You know, day to day life, right? If you want to, right? Um, so but then when it comes to your racing um i think you've got to think like why are you doing that right so my general guidelines is hey if if you're not being sick 30 miles into a race well why do you need to go like high fat low carb and oh i don't need to take any fuel if you can if you've got a great stomach and you can eat like you know the um you know the cookies at the aid station and you can have the fruit and you can have the energy drink well i would just carry on with that why are you going to mess with it and go to this like and i don't want to say it's an extreme diet but it is you know it's a lifestyle diet that you've got to be committed to so first i'd question why would someone consider that now i think a fair consideration is like yeah every race i go in i'm you know i feel really nauseous at this point and i'm dropping out or i'm really slowing down because of my stomach right then if people want to try that way then you know go ahead and try it because then in theory you can consume far less calories during a race i am not the expert um i think you have to be really quite committed to it um and i would say um so i coach for shaman ultra and we've got another coach called zach bitter um zach has got the world record for 100 miles and for 12 hours which he set last year and he is very into uh, that kind of diet and he's got all sorts of resources i can't remember zach's website but if you look up zach z-a-c-h bitter um then you'll find him and he's probably like a good one like he does lots of again podcasts and articles and whatever um but my first thing is like yeah consider why you're doing it and i i certainly don't really i'll be honest and this is again just my opinion i don't think you're going to get better results off it right um if you're doing it because you're being sick okay that's a that's a different reason right but then it's not just something you're doing on race day obviously like you're changing you know what you're eating every single day of you know the week and the month and the year so yeah. yeah, it's it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because I think a lot of people use it initially to try to lose some weight because of like, you know, burning fat instead of carbs. And then um, as you go on, ultra runners are trying to teach the body to burn fat rather for fuel rather than needing to eat all the time. So you can kind of understand it, but um, you still need a bit of carbs to um, facilitate the burning of the fat in the first place. So you can't completely yeah. cut it out. Um, and no, if and you want to perform that's... at any level, you've got to have carbs because that's what the body is fueled by and that's something that yeah if people look up zach um exactly they'll find that like he does eat carbs right but it's very specific amounts and timed and around races and all this kind of stuff right i don't Uh, think i could be bothered with all of that (laughs) the other thing i'd say right and this is just again general stuff you know like if anybody is out there thinking about this it, it takes a long time to adapt right like it's not like oh well I've switched and like so you have to be prepared one to go the long haul on it and two that you're going to feel worse before you feel better so 
if you well nobody's got a race coming up immediately <laughs> right yes but even if, even if you've got a race in maybe four months time you, this is going to be quite a big change and I I mean personally if again somebody was asking me I'd say maybe you want to do that like at the end of your racing year make that adaptation and then you're adjusted and you've done the trial and error and the mistakes before you're ramping up for you know your next uh, sort of season of training and racing so yeah uh, we've got some some chat on the live chat here about going keto um, yeah and some people uh, some Robert Jordan for example he says I'm I feel amazing and even my heel yeah. spur is gone he's been trying to lose quite a lot of weight lately so um he's doing that for a reason and then Alex Dehoto says um uh, basically you're not Killian John A so I, th I think what he's saying is like if you're not at the top level then you know you don't need to kind of mess with any special diet particularly yeah and it, again yeah if people want to do it for lifestyle and I'm not going to be but you know okay I'm really glad that gentleman has, no longer has a heel spur is it coincidence or like that it's gone or is it linked to the diet no nobody really knows because we're all experiments of one mm -hmm. and this is the other thing like for example I will put it out there right I'm vegetarian I'm not going to go and tell anybody else to be to be vegetarian and some diets do work better for some people rather than others mm. right yeah just yeah. yeah like Chrissy TV here she says I tried paleo two weeks ago couldn't even get through one day I was faint anxious and dizzy by about 3 p.m. every day um, and then new new phone who dis interesting name says uh, keto was tried in the 80s already it wasn't very successful um, cool so yeah it's a different lots I mean, of different it clearly, things it clearly going works on. in my defense of it it clearly works because Zach Bitter mm. on that diet yeah which he's been on for many years right and there's other people like jeff browning who's one of the top us ultra runners right like he swears by it so there are a lot of people who are performing at a very high level that do on it that do well on it mm. but then there's a lot of people that are eating a pretty average diet right yeah. and then there's vegans like you yeah. know who are also performing very well so yeah yeah like, it's, you just there's no one fits all you. yeah and um, no. Bram Van Diemen who's just joined us has I, I know two runners who have finished 500k legends trail while partially fueled with smoked sausage and mayonnaise mmm sounds nice <laughs> That's cool. Um, great. So, yeah, tons of chat on the live. Um, or everyone's giving people tips left, right, and center on, you know, like antiacids and stuff like this and what they use. So that's fantastic. Um, and so we just better answer this uh, question from Ruth Ellis here about um, training around your monthly cycle. So this is for the ladies amongst you. If you're a man, then stay tuned because, you know, the ladies in your life might need some advice. Um, but um, uh, Ruth says, hi, Claire and Ellie. I would love to know if you schedule your training around your monthly cycle, do you notice any difference in performance at certain times of your cycle? Um, so she said Claire and Ellie, so I'll just I'll just kick off with um, my take on this because I know that this has become much more acceptable to talk about in, in kind of, well, recent, well, maybe a year. Like when I was growing oh, up, this yes. was definitely <laughs> not acceptable to talk about. Um, but, but yeah, I'm totally cool with, with chatting about stuff uh, like this. Um, but for me, because I'm not an elite runner or anything, I don't actually notice. So I, I don't really notice whether I'm performing better or worse, whether I'm due for my period or whether I'm on the, my period or anything anything um i actually went for a run today because i had major pe um, period pain and um i'm trying to limit my use of paracetamol because there's none in morrison's right now so i went for a run and that alleviated the period pain so i was like yes brilliant um so that was good um but it i I don't notice a difference in my performance, but that's only because i'm not training at elite level and i'm not kind of monitoring myself but i just wondered yeah how do you find it do you notice anything do your clients notice stuff I think, again, I think it's individual, right? Um, I mean, personally, I never, like, I never structured my training around around that, right? Like, you know, most of the time it was like, I felt totally fine, I didn't notice it, right? I do appreciate that some women are like, they're like, I would not go running, like, I just feel so awful, right? Like, either low energy or like an upset stomach or whatever it might be, right? Um, so, I, I must admit, I haven't actually 
despite the fact I do coach like proportionally way more women ultra runners than the average that exists in the world I mean I've had a few coaching clients where for sure and and this is one thing like to track it right you know of you know like they might put notes in their training plan and I'm, I'm and I've had a couple of women where for sure they're like I know that was a terrible run because it was a certain time in their month, right? And they didn't feel good, right? Um, and I think maybe for some people, then they might say, you know, okay, I know this is going to happen every month. So, you know, this week or these few days or whatever, you know, we're going to have we're not going to have to work around it, but this is not a good time to maybe do a speed workout or a particularly long run or whatever, right? I think, I mean, the other thing, okay, there's been very little research on this, right? And this is the trouble, right? You know, like particularly when you come to ultra running, right? And also, which I'm sure was the majority of people that are watching juggle with is like, you know, training plans are generally based on, well, most people work Monday to Friday and I need to run long on the weekend. So and not that I'm saying you shouldn't take this into account, but if you go, oh, well, there's these four days where I can't run, uh, then, you know, which if it genuinely, you know, women are feeling the effects so badly, you might go, okay, yeah, well, we'll have to miss a long run or not do speed workouts. And definitely as a coach, I'd be totally amenable to that. Um, one resource, I can't remember the name of the book, but um, she's called Dr. Stacy Sims. Oh, yeah. um, and she has got a book um, and she's also on Instagram. Um, she's got a TED talk, actually. So that would be worth people tuning into of basically on this concept that women are not small men and you should not train well not you should not train in the same way but like most training concepts are based around men right um so yeah um and then also i mean it has been shown that often when women are on their periods they can actually do better right mm. uh, at races yeah that, that that actually is you know again no if you've got debilitating cramps probably <laughs> not but if you're somebody that doesn't have too many uh, like side effects and symptoms then they actually can perform surprisingly or even better than normal but then like they said people are like we're not wanting to talk that down because then you start going oh well I'm I'm not having my period so I'm going to have a terrible race <laughs> right? so you can go the other extreme right I've never done it there's these apps now right that are like period trackers and I know like you know if somebody's thinking ah oh, like if you're starting to notice you have like why did I randomly not feel that good on that run? That doesn't make sense. Like, but I had an easy week in my training. So this week I should be feeling great or whatever it might be. Maybe that is something you want to do. Like use one of those trackers and see how it like ties up with, you know, your running in general. So, yeah. So yeah. it's, it's a bit like the nutrition, isn't it? It's different for every person and you just got to see how your own body I, works. Yeah. I mean, generally I would say my personal experience was like, I didn't really notice anything, but nor was I looking for it. Right. Yeah. And maybe, maybe I did have some workouts and I was like, Oh, that was random. That wasn't very good. And I just didn't tie the two things together, yeah. which is why, you know, having a training log, right. You know, and maybe using one of these trackers can be a good idea, particularly if you are saying, oh, like, I don't know, this just doesn't make sense. Like, I would have thought that run felt good and it didn't. And you might start to notice patterns. And obviously, yeah, for women that have more, you know, severe side effects, of course, it would make sense, right? That you might say, hey, I don't know, on these three or four days, you know, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to feel good. Okay, in that case, wait a minute, do I, you know, schedule easier runs or take some days off and, you know, move things around, right? Because there's no magic really to like a seven day training cycle, really. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, I hope that answers your question, Ruth. Um, and thank you so much for sending that. But she in. should check out Dr. Stacy. Dr. Stacy Sims would be a really good TED talk and book to look into. So. Fantastic. That's really good advice and, and really interesting to hear from your side as well. Um, so yeah, just uh, just wanted to get a couple more questions before um, before we we leave you because uh, you've spent a whole hour with us now, which is absolutely lovely of you. Um, so I was just wondering um, how you would feel if somebody did manage to break your 2012 um, Western <laughs> States 100 record like possibly the race won't go ahead this year but you know if Claire Gallagher had a good day if Courtney DeWalter had a good day then um, then yeah do, like how would you feel and, and and who do you think is most on the cards for for breaking that record in the future um like Courtney for sure right um 
so and and i'm sure there's other women out there right that, that could break it as well but if if you would say okay name one person yeah courtney um and uh yeah she was well on pace to break it last year right um last year again the weather was favorable and i'm not again because people always said oh well ellie you only broke the record because of the weather so i don't <laughs> want to be well courtney was only on pace because of the weather right <laughs> but clearly having you know weather that is conducive to running a bit faster i.e cooler right is going to help anyone right could courtney break it on a cooking hot year um, probably but it's of course it's going to make it harder right um yeah but then it it, ta it takes a bit of luck or i say a, a lack of bad luck like courtney had bad luck you know this ran i don't know if she'd had that hip pain before western states right but you know it took her out right and this is the thing with 100 miles like you kind of need like if, if you're really going to i mean it's a it's an okay record right so i think for someone to break it there can't be too much to go wrong if that makes sense right like it can't be like well yeah like you know i don't know i had this little injury so i slowed down yeah. we saw or, a bear you know we had to stop for a bear and it's cubs to cross the path like yeah, in yeah, 2011 yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you could have small things like that, right? But anyway, but yeah, you couldn't have too much to go majorly wrong. I don't think I'll be proved wrong, right, for, for somebody to break it. And yeah, I mean, do I want it broken? No, not really. Like, let's <laughs> I love honest. your honesty because everyone in the UK but, is always like, um, oh, I know you're from Scotland, but um, I know everyone yeah. in the UK is always like, oh, you know, records are there to be broken. They're always dead modest oh, about yeah. it. So I love the way that you're just like, well, actually, no, I don't want it to be broken. I think but, that's really refreshing. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, I'd absolutely congratulate yeah. anybody that did. But I don't think there's many people that would say, yeah, I'd happy not to be that record holder. Like, there's nothing <laughs> negative about being the Western States record holder. It's kind of neat. Of course, it will get broken at some point, right? And yeah, times are getting faster and the field is getting, you know, like more dynamic yeah. and like close. T-shirts so, are getting yeah. holier. Yeah, yeah. So we'll, uh, yeah, we'll see this year, right? Yeah, but yeah, Courtney, maybe. Courtney would have... Courtney would have got it last year had it not been for her hip, no doubt about it. Mm. But again, Courtney's a pretty exceptional runner, yeah. right? Have you guys so. met? Have you met her? Uh, no, not really. I mean, I've gone go Courtney at like about mile 15 of Western States last year when I was helping I run far. But other than that, no, I've not met her. So yeah, but uh, and I always say you can't you can't choose who breaks your record. But if somebody's going to, yeah, I'm not going to object if it's somebody like Courtney. Yeah, so, oh, yeah. that is that's brilliant. Um, and so uh, yeah, all that remains to be said is about your coaching. So we did have um, somebody uh, saying, did you do remote coaching just earlier on here? Um, I think it was Graham Howes. Um, so yeah, just tell tell people a little bit about your coaching that you do because this it would be great if you got a few more um, coaching clients from this. Here we go, Graham Howes. Um, Claire, <laughs> is it possible to get a training plan from Ellie? She is an ultra coach. Does she do remote plans? Yeah, tell us more. Uh, so the answer, Graham, is kind of yes, kind of no. So yes, <laughs> I work as an online uh, like um, yeah coach. So uh, of course I can do online stuff, um, which makes this whole COVID nineteen thing like <laughs> really not a lot different, right? Um, I don't do standalone training plans. Um, so I work for Sharman Ultra, like under Ian Sharman. So that's. Uh, S H A R M A N Ultra dot com. So um, yeah, so I work for them. That's what I do full time. Um, well, the reason we don't do standalone training plans, and by that I mean, you know, Graham, I wouldn't create. Here's a 16 week plan. Nice to have met you. Bye. Go go and do 16 weeks of running. Mm -hmm. Right. The reason we don't do that is we know, like, hey, if I'd done that and now your race plans change because of COVID-19, you're left looking at a worthless piece of paper or, you know, an online plan, right? Um, or if a work scenario comes up or you get ill or whatever it might be, or you're adapting to the training better and you just go, well, I'll just stick to this plan that I got given 10 weeks ago and just stick with it, right? So um, what we do is, yes, we do like long-term plans and some people just stick with me for, you know, four or five months and up to a race. I've coached other people for five years um, through various races and they're you know 
downtime and all this kind of stuff and recovery from races and whatnot and we do uh, Skype calls or FaceTime like every two weeks or every four weeks um, and emails as well right the reason being then you can say like hey here my race has got cancelled now I'm thinking of this race how would that change my training or you can say you know I got ill for three days and I'll go okay well don't worry about that run but let's switch this around whatever it might be right and it also allows the opportunity to not just go you know I always say the training plan is like the fundamentals of the coaching but there's so many other things a lot of which we've sort of touched on today like nutrition or gear or whatever right and it's absolutely impossible to do that so even if someone follows a perfect training plan the longer a race gets the more these other elements come in and that's why personally at Charmin Ultra we find that having a coach that you have regular contact with gets you a lot more out of it so yes yes that is an excellent answer um and John Gardner says uh, you can see why Ellie is a great coach love her answer so <laughs> well done there <Lynn. laughs> that sounds great um oh, that's absolutely fantastic um we we have now been chatting for an hour and 15 minutes so I better let you go and get on with your day because I know it's like what a half half 12 it's kind of lunchtime it's, just over there in Canada yeah, it's lunchtime I'm about to speak to I'm sure you won't be saying some of you might know Hideo Deo Tanko uh, or Takano. He's um, he's a UK ultra runner. So oh. I'm about to speak to him. Oh, so brilliant. yeah, I've got another UK call coming up. Fingers crossed. He's meant to be doing comrades and hard rock. So uh, yeah, obviously hard rock's a little ways away, right? But uh, yeah, so I've got a got a UK coach and client to speak to next. Awesome. Well, um, Guy Greaterex says uh, in these horrific times, it was great fun um, to have this hour escape, um, and I thank you both for that. And I think that's what we need as well, right? Like right now, like if people have had races cancelled, I know park runs not happening in the UK or whatever, right? We can still all go run, right? And I get it. You might have those, like, and I've had a couple of coaching clients where they're like, you gave me that workout. Well, I didn't do it. I just went and run. And I'm like, look, fine. Take a few days to like regroup, get used to what's going on. But ultimately go out and run don't listen to like a news podcast whilst we're out running put some favorite music on <laughs> yeah. put some back some back catalog running podcast when COVID-19 didn't exist and so there will be no mention of that and yeah I think it's good to, uh, running we could all switch off for a little while and there's nothing wrong with that yeah so. yeah that's totally totally you've just summed it all up there it's amazing um and everybody is yeah everyone's quickly adding a, a last thing to the live chat to say thank you to you so we've got um Graham Howe says thank you for that answer I'll be popping over to the website to check you guys out um, Sebastian says thanks a lot for doing this interview it was a lot of fun um, Chrissy TV says thanks Ellie and Claire Mano Trails Titus says thank you um, and everyone says a great live stream thanks so much for all the in insight and advice Ellie really appreciate it all so I, I think you've done your pu public service tonight Ellie <laughs> yeah good well, it's been nice chatting and yeah thanks everybody for tuning in so. fantastic uh, well, good night, everybody, um, and keep following Wild Ginger Running for more amazing people like Ellie, and um, and definitely sign up um, and have a look at um, www.shamanultra.com um, because, uh, yeah, you can get some uh, great coaching tips from uh, all of the coaches on Ian's website, um, and uh, there's some tips from Ian that I've put out on Monday night as well so um, they're, they're just really knowledgeable group of people and uh, thank you so much Ellie for um, for the great chat and I hope no one rec breaks your records for a good few years a few years yet yeah cool okay thanks cool. so much thanks bye. guys bye